Hi, I'm Lise Wheel with Law and Crime. We're interrupting the, the live testimony here in the Donald Smith murder case, the penalty stage. I want to bring in my dear friend and colleague, Linda Fairstein, who was the, uh, you know, the, you know her very well. She really doesn't need an introduction. The famous prosecutor here in Manhattan. She was the head of the Manhattan uh, violent crimes, uh, sex offender uh, unit here in Manhattan for a very long time, tried a very famous cases, uh, went from there after that, and is now a very I internationally known thriller writer, uh, which is where I know Linda now in our, in our, in, in our other dual <laughs> lives, in our second lives. Um, but she and I were talking sort of off screen here as we're listening to this witness, and we were also talking about the witnesses that we'd heard earlier on in the Donald Smith case today, the witnesses um, put on now by the defense. And you'll recall in this defense that, that in the main trial, uh, the meat of the trial, if you will, the defense didn't put on any defense. Um, it just let the prosecution put on its case, and the, and the witnesses, uh, excuse me, the jurors, took about 15 minutes to come back with that guilty verdict on all of the counts uh, for murder and rape, as you know. Now they're in the penalty stage. Will he get the death penalty? And of course, now the defense is putting on all of these witnesses. Uh, the expert witnesses this morning were sort of back and forth, whether or not he had sort of this disease or defect, uh, and whether, you know, issues with his mother and all of that. And now we have another witness on the stand. I wanted Linda, to, wanted to bring Linda in because she has so much expertise in exactly these kinds of cases. Linda, how do you think this is working? How do you think it's playing for the jury? Tell me about what you think about the defense uh, strategy in all of this. Well, I understand as you do what the defense is trying to do. So they've had these psychiatrists trying to figure out, is this a mental illness? Did addiction affect his acts? We heard no this afternoon that it didn't. Now you've got, a, obviously, a very bright lawyer, once prosecutor, now defense. And he's going through the litany at the lawyers, at Smith's lawyer's request, of crimes, most of them in the pedophile category, right. going back to the 1970s. Right. Perhaps, as we'll hear when, when uh, the summation occurs on this issue, the proof is supposed to be that this is a guy who can't help himself that mm. because of the mother, because of the drugs, because of some sort of mental illness, these things happen one after the other. My view would be working with people as you have who sit on your juries, the juries are mm. going to be totally offended by this. They are going to think that this is a man who should not be outside the door of a locked facility ever again because he just continues and continues to offend. Um, in the 1970s, and these acts go back to the 1970s, right. it was the first time, uh, and I was a prosecutor then, that uh, prisons struggled to rehabilitate sex offenders, and programs were Rehabilitation created. was part of the, if you will, the triad of, of, of the, the criminal exactly. justice system. Remember exactly. that? Exactly, yes. yes. And obviously, if these guys are going to be paroled someday, let's make it safer right. for the people on the street. The most famous of which in our northeast area was in Avenal, New Jersey, part of the prison system. Um, and everybody, I think, will recall there's now a Jesse's Law, sadly. Mm -hmm. uh, an offender was declared rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. He was released to the street. Across from him lived a six-year-old girl. He wasn't there days before he said, come see the puppy in my backyard, lured her in, and killed her. Hence Jesse's to law. this day, right. hence Jesse's law. To this day, I think even uh, psychiatrists who work in this field will agree there is not a known means of rehabilitation for pedophiles, for repeat exactly. child molesters. Exactly. All, the say All the studies say that. All the studies I mean, pretty much in yeah. agreement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so your take on this is that this is actually going to be offensive to the jurors that are sitting there. It's not going to be rehabilitative to the, to the uh, to Donald Smith and to his case. Why then would the defense? I mean, we, we've got the witness list here. We're not even halfway through it. Why would they be even trying to do this? You know, as, as you do know, sometimes they try and take the sale out of the prosecutor's win and say, if we come forward with this and say this is who this man is, he couldn't help himself, right. Right. Uh, you know, it, they think they're going to get a break for doing it. Otherwise, the prosecutor would have done 1977, right. 1981, again and again and again. Right. So whether that's the reason and they're doing it or they have a real belief that this man um, couldn't help himself. 
and and you see him, he's sitting at council table, as your viewers can see. He's laughing at yeah. some of the yeah. testimony. I, I just don't see that it's a picture that is going to get into the hearts and minds of these jurors who convicted him in in, in record order, in really record yeah. time. In 15, and, and of course, these jurors are death penalty qualified. Yes, and this so, is a state, this is a state where there right. are more than 200 people on death row now. Right, right. Thank you, Linda, so much. We're going to coming back to you later in the hour. Right now, we'll go back to the live testimony in the Donald Smith trial, or the Donald Smith penalty stage, I should say. Hi, I'm Lise Wheel at Long Crime. We're coming out of the Donald Smith case. So we're, we're going, coming out of the live penalty phase here. And in studio with me, I've got Linda Fairstein here. Uh, again, she needs no introduction. Uh, the famed criminal prosecutor here in Manhattan for many years in exactly these kind of cases, these uh, sexual rape and murder cases in Manhattan. And of course, is the famed, internationally famed uh, criminal uh, thriller writer now, which I know like her you. in this other in this other <laughs> life that we have. Um, it seems here now we're getting a sense of it in now in the cross examination phase here um, of this defense lawyer, Mr. Bazan, that it is really kind of a um, what the defense is doing is sort of a blame the community. Why hadn't this horrible pedophile been uh, locked up way before so that he couldn't be out there doing it? You know, all of these plea deals and kind of that. How is that going to sit with this jury, do you think? This could reach a couple of jurors. I mean, to, to know that the system failed, uh, perhaps, in keeping this child safe, that there were many of these crimes, and Bosun's going through each one right. of them, uh, that that um, Smith was eligible for much longer sentences than he right, got. Right. So the prosecutor's trying to give reasons for plea negotiations. Of course, as you know, that in happened. pedophile cases, mm -hmm. especially do you save the child, mm -hmm. um, the embarrassment, the trauma of going into a courtroom and seeing the guy again? I mean, there are balances that are weighed in every kind of crime, but I certainly think in this category. And so you think that there must have been a point in each of these cases, you hope that it was not just the laziness of a prosecutor not want, wanting to take on a case um, or a witness who disappeared. Um, I'm child, listening to not, this. Not wanting to. Not testify. wanting to. And you wonder, as you and I have talked about the resonance of this right after Parkland right. and the FBI, the system, not acting on a complaint. Mm -hmm. And there could be jurors sitting in that box thinking, it was the state's job. They had him time after time. Man, they needed no. to keep him in jail. So this one has a little more shot at, at reaching some jurors, I think, than just the litany of his crimes. But play that out for us. If that, so, so let's say that reaches a juror. Would that then mean that the juror would say, it, 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 okay, I'll take that all the way and, and take the death penalty off the table for him because I'm so mad at what the community, the system, the prosecutor, the investigators didn't do. I'm going to punish them. Don't ever do this again kind of thing. Send that message. It's I mean, would it, you know, it so they, I'm, I'm playing stroke. it out for you. Absolutely. Uh, would they do it or would they, or would it go the other way and say, I'm so angry at the system. I'm feeling a little bit of personal guilt because we as a community didn't protect this little child, didn't protect, you know, those that were shot in Parkland. I mean, you know, you, yeah. can, just yeah. see, you can see these emotions kind of playing because Linda, let's face it, we're at an emotional stage here. Completely. In the death penalty stage. Completely. These case. people had this you is know, emotional. 15 minutes tolerance for, the, for right. no defense exactly. uh, for exactly. getting this guy. Now the emotions are going to come to play. Yes. So yes. if you play, and I completely agree with everything you just said, I'm just wondering how does that balance? Well, I think it looks like from the list of witnesses that Smith's attorney is just taking everything kitchen he's got, sink. kitchen right. sink, throwing it against the wall. Right. Maybe something will stick with juror number six or juror number four, and they'll say the state should have done it. On the other hand, many more of them are likely to say the state didn't do it last time. This we're time we're making sure 
he'll never see daylight uh, again. Yeah, but it can't be just many more of them, right? It's no. Like, oh, that's all. Yes, got to be all. And you can see right here, as, we, as, we, as we're talking, you can always watch Long Crime. You can always flip back and forth from the two of us talking about it to be watching it live. You can always got the live option, but we want to come in, and when we've got Linda here, we've got such a wonderful resource here right in studio. I'm not going to let her go. I will. We will feed her while we have to have some water. I'll run out and across the studio. I'll run out and get her a bagel if necessary to keep her here because she's just such a national treasure to have. I'm oh, telling please. you, we are so lucky to have her here in studio. So you're not. She's not leaving, but we will go back to uh, live on full screen uh, back to the sentencing stage in the Donald Smith case in Florida. Hello, I'm Lise Wheel with Long Crime back here. The attorneys are going to a sidebar to discuss an issue before they go back to the penalty stage and bring in the next witness on the witness list. They've gone through about half of the witnesses that they've told us are going to go through two experts uh, and then Dr. Michael Bozen. So it, uh, it looks like they have uh, quite a few witnesses list, listed. They have listed the, these people. They don't always necessarily, Linda Fairstein, go through uh, all the people. They don't actually put them all on the stand. But as you were just saying a few minutes ago, the defense looks like they're kind of doing, throwing the kitchen sink in here um, uh, on, their, on the defense in the, uh, in the penalty stage. So they may actually put all 11 of them on. Um, at this point, we don't. And know. you sort of don't blame them for they no. didn't put a defense on right. during the trial. Right. So this is what they've got left. Anybody right. who might have a bit or piece, and certainly your viewers saw that the prosecution on cross made pretty good uh, recovery with even in this penalty phase a couple of the shrinks who were who wouldn't say that the addiction or the mental illness caused him to commit these crimes. Right. And in one, in one of the uh, experts actually said that there were no mitigating factors. No mitigating circumstances. Yes. I, know circumstances. I, I mean, if you have that from one of your own experts. Um, now, what do you think about that? Was that a real blunder on the part of the defense? I mean, if you've got your own expert on the stand and don't you know that they're going to say they're no mitigating? I mean, that's a legal term, no mitigating circumstances. That, that really hurts you. Well, you know well how important it is to prep your witnesses. And yeah. these, this defense team uh, didn't have to do much prep to since they that. put on no defendants. <laughs> right, right. So this is what they've got. And, yeah, you'd think that... Um, not to be critical of their whole approach, maybe something's up their sleeve, but you would think that though that's one of the topics that you would expect, uh, expect them to have covered so that there would not be that kind of shocking answer. I don't know, if you were talking about up their sleeves, we've gone through two doctors, we've gone through uh, Michael Boss, and when we're looking at a witness approach in the stand, the others on the st um, witness list are other doctors, and we've also got Mr. Donald Smith on uh, the witness list. His, we have, his yeah. son, I think, right? I think yeah, the son junior, exactly. Right. So we kind of know. I mean, it's not exactly like with it's a shocking uh, who's going to be on the, uh, taking the stand. But let's go back to the live. Uh, uh, let's go back live to the penalty stage of the of the Smith case. We've got another witness taking the stand right now. I'm Lisa Wheel with Long Crime. We're going to go out of the Donald Smith case in Florida. And we're going to go straight into the Wisconsin v. George Birch case in Wisconsin, obviously. That is the case against George Birch uh, for the killing of Nicole Vanderheiden. We have now on the stand, or just going to be on the stand here, there we go, uh, the babysitter on the night that Nicole was killed. She's on the stand. She's on cross-examination now by the defense. Now, critical, remember now, the defense says that it was Nicole's boyfriend that killed her. So the babysitter on the stand is critical to the defense in this case. Let's listen. Okay, we're not hearing any audio yet from the courtroom, so we're waiting to hear that. I have with me here in uh, our studio here in New York, Linda Fairstein here, who's been also following the case with me. Linda, so we've got the babysitter here on the stand in this case. A uh, fascinating case where, you know, the na national attention, of course, has been on it because of the Fitbit uh, bit on this. Yes. Uh, which First is, one I've known to have this I, issue. I think for many of us, yes. Uh, but now we've got sort of the babysitter here on the stand who could establish, could potentially 
establish something for the defense um, or not. Um, and so that's why she's so critical with her, with her testimony today. Um, what do you think of this uh, sort of elaborate defense uh, that Birch has, which is that it's not him. Um, he, you know, he's, he, was, he was there. He can't say that he wasn't there. He's saying yes to everything that the defense or the prosecution has said. His DNA is there. He can't, he can't, you know, not establish that. But that he was forced to, all he did was forced to move the body. Um, and uh, that was it. And, and you know, it was, it was the boyfriend that did it. And we know that the boyfriend was actually arrested first right. and in custody for about 18 days before things changed. Right. So you would think that the babysitter, who has some knowledge of not only the victim, but her social sexual dynamic with her boyfriend. And the, the interaction is, between the two of them. Absolutely. Right. Should be of great value. And as you say, I mean, the defense might be using this if, if there was fighting, if there had been Argument regular. Yes. Or anything that happened between the two of them. Right. They're right. digging for all of that. And of course, for the night in question, I assume this woman was still at the home when Nicole failed to appear. And what happened next? I mean, who, who, right. who right, right, how right. did she learn about it? Who, who told her? How did she find out? Right. Uh, one of the fascinating things to me in this case is that in, in so many murder cases, uh, uh, really any criminal cases, uh, hard criminal cases, the defense doesn't have to testify. Whereas in this case, I don't see how it, the defense gets out without testifying. I don't see how, I think Birch has to testify. It would seem so. I mean, because as you said, there's so much of his DNA at the scene on the body, on things around the body. Uh, that's got to be explained. And I don't see anybody else who can say, I was there, but she was already dead. Right. Uh, all I did was help move the body. Uh, in most states, I'm sure Wisconsin too, moving or concealing a body is so, a little I was gonna right. say, it's a tiny little crime. It's going away for a murder and a right. murder where there were more than 200 focal points of injury right. on Nicole's body, evidence of strangulation. I mean, simply. Um, I always hate when people say brutal murder because they're all, well, they're all bad, bad. They, but the amount of injury right. far more than needed to kill this young woman. Now, what could she be, the, uh, the uh, babysitter, be giving for the prosecution, do you think? I mean, if you were prosecuting this case, why would you want the babysitter on the stand? What would she establish for you if you were prosecuting the case? You probably need to have her for timeline. You probably need to have her for what condition. Uh, Nicole was sober when she left the right. house. Nicole got in a car. She told me she'd come home at this particular point in time. She was or wasn't going to do this. This is what she was wearing. Her clothes were clean. They were intact. There were, she had no injuries or bruises. She could set up most closely before Nicole left the house everything about her maybe give a dynamic, good or bad, for the boyfriend. Exactly. Oh, fascinating. All right, we'll go back to Birch as soon as we get the audio back from that courtroom. In the meantime, let's go back to Donald Smith. We're in, that, in the live penalty stage of the Donald Smith case in Florida. Lisa Wheel with Long Crime. I want to take a break from the expert testimony of, in uh, the Donald Smith case. You can, t you can click on it. You can see it live. But, but I, I just want to give you a chance here to hear from a real expert that we have here in the studio. Larry, Linda Fairstein is still with me. Thank you so much for staying with me. My pleasure. Prosecutor from the DA's office uh, and the lead prosecutor in domestic violence and, uh, and murder cases here in Manhattan um, and also a wonderful thriller writer. Um, <laughs> But we've been hearing now from this expert, this neurologist expert, um, and he is very well qualified. The science is qualified. We've been seeing up on the, on the stand uh, the images of the brain. He's been talking about, you know, that Donald Smith had a, a neurological problem since he was from six months to puberty, Christmas lights on and off, all of this kind of stuff going at the jury. Um, is the jury, in your estimation, are they you know, taking this all in, are they getting it? Are they are their eyes sort of glazing over? How do you think the jury is responding to this? I am using your expression, eyes glazing over. Okay. They are looking at these charts, charts that we see up on the screen. Right. These images of the brain broken into pink and blue green and white and we and with all respect to Dr. Colino, right. It 
it must be an accepted science, as you say, to have the He's judge been, allow it right, to testify. Allow, right. I'm not familiar with it at all. I'll, I'll bone up uh, a little later. But it's yet one more, this is somebody else's fault. It's uh, Blaming. It's not Mr. Right. Smith, and it's cross-wiring the brain, something about like Christmas the Christmas lights. lights, too many Christmas lights, or not right. enough Christmas lights, and going back to the age of six months. And I just don't see, I mean, look at these pictures, mm -hmm. look as the jury will at the images, the just unbearably right. impossible to look at images of the body of the eight-year-old child. And I don't think that anybody's going to hang with Dr. Colino here. Right, right. And in a, in a way, I mean, look at, at looking at all the, the images that we've had earlier today, the images of all of the other arrests and all the other convictions and all of the other chances, if you will, that he had or that the system gave him, because that's the other way to look yes. at it, is that the system you know, we can look at it one way, the system um, did us wrong and didn't, didn't protect us. The other way to look at it is, it gave him a lot of chances, it gave right? I mean, he had a lot of chances to get absolutely. out of jail. I absolutely. mean, literally. Yep. And, he, and, he didn't, and he didn't then turn his life around and become a good guy. In fact, he ended his life of crime with doing this most heinous and horrible crime, where then it's, you know, um, we had to have the testimony of little Cherish's mother up there, right? Which, of course, then was not met with any, you know, cross examination. Correct. And you add to that. I mean, this is not a stupid man. I mean, this man could talk. Listen right. to the history he gave to Dr. Colino. Right. He felt like he was on skating on yes, thin ice yes, yes, and yes, about exactly. to fall through. So what? what does he do? He doesn't get psychiatric help. He takes crack. Right. Um, he ta you know, which so is a voluntary was, act. Which is a voluntary act, certainly in his case, and he knows he's not a kid. Right. He knows the consequences, and so the 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 fact that he could think and form thoughts of that coherent, mm -hmm. and then do something that's, not nah, I don't need help. I don't want to be stopped from falling through right. that thin ice. Maybe he likes it on thin ice because right. he's been there time and time again. I mean, it's. It's interesting as a science. I don't think it, it's a way out for Mr. Smith. And he even said to one of the experts, he wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you spend as much time in court Welcome as to the he bar. has. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just, uh, uh, you know, abs but, but it just shows this sort of hubris, too. You yes. know, this laughing. And, and uh, uh, last week, Linda, I, I, I don't, you probably haven't seen it, last week there was a photo um, that we actually have here at Long Crime, where he um, looked like he was posing for the courtroom cameras. I mean, it was just it was just despicable. So there was, you know, there's just this this hubris that is, is on top of you know one thing after the other, and 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 this lack of remorse that um, that is not really sort of being explained here in the analysis that we're seeing today, even in this expert testimony that as we've talked about in the first two in the first two experts, really didn't you know, blatantly said there are no mitigating circumstances here. Specifically including no lack of remorse. Exactly. And you just said a really interesting thing about his posing for the camera here. I've not seen that picture. We don't see the jurors as we're on Correct. TV. Right. Those jurors see him Absolutely. throughout all of this. Absolutely. And so if he's posing for the camera, if he is ridiculing a witness, if he's laughing at an inappropriate time, uh, all of these things, and nobody said he's not mentally competent, that all of these things will absolutely make a difference to the jury. That's right. One of the th things that you're taught uh, in, in lawyering, prosecuting, defensing 101 when you're a trial lawyer is that one of the jurors will always be looking at you. Maybe not all 12 of them, but one or more will always be looking at you. And same for the defense yes, defendant. Absolutely. So, and then they go back, and then in deliberation, they'll talk about what they saw. Did you see the moment Did you see when, when, they, he, when exactly. she said this? Yeah. I was staring at him. And yeah, this is posing for the camera yeah. or laughing at that inappropriate moment. So it's yes. not as if all 12 are unilaterally switching back and forth like this, but one or more will be looking at the defendant at all time. And that's exactly right. And the other point that we were talking about is that all of these uh, jurors 
have been death penalty qualified. They have said that if they found him guilty, they would be able to say, we would find him to, we would meet out the death penalty. Um, and they have, they've said before, you know, they were even put on this uh, jury trial that they would do that, that they could do that. Yes, and I think that's confusing to some viewers who aren't it. from states that have death penalties and, and don't do that, that we used to get into situations where at the end of a trial, someone would suddenly say to the judge, you know, my gut, I just don't think I could ever impose the death penalty. Right. So this kind of hearing is done, as your expression is, death qualified right. before they even begin to hear evidence. And uh, that's certainly not helpful to the defense uh, in this case. And it means that these people are serious about what, what they are charged now with doing. Right. And I come back to the fact that they came to the jury, the verdict, and the verdict point before the penalty phase in about 15 minutes. Uh, that can't bode well for Mr. Smith. But let's go back. We don't know yet. Let's go back to the, uh, the penalty phase here. We're in live testimony, and we've got a uh, qualified neurologist on the stand, uh, and we're in the middle of his testimony.